recording started. Okay, everybody. Uh, thanks a lot for participating. My name is Dave Yenishik. I am a safety consultant with the uh, Pennsylvania OSHA consultation program out of Indiana University of Pennsylvania. The topic we're going to cover today um, is going to be fall protection and construction. Um, so once again, there's the uh, teleconference number, participant number, if you want to jot that down if you're having issues with your computer speakers, um, you know, you may find it easier to call in on the teleconference. Um, for today's presentation, um, I'm going to be recording the presentation. It'll be posted on our webpage uh, probably within the next couple weeks. Um, it's going to be a PowerPoint presentation. I have a lot of photos um, added, so um, hopefully this will be some good opportunities for you to you folks to maybe see some new things or share with coworkers and colleagues. Um, regarding questions, um, you feel free to uh, write a question into the chat box. We have uh, myself and we have other consultants kind of monitoring the chat. If the questions uh, results in an answer, which is pretty simple, pretty easy, uh, we may just answer it right on the chat box there. Either way, um, if you do write a question and um, it's something that may take a little more detail, a little research, um, we're going to answer all those questions as well. We'll just post that stuff on our website within the next week. So any question you ask, um, if it's not answered, even if it is answered, we'll capture those questions and we'll post them on our website um, for everybody to see, along with the presentation. Um, just keep note that I did turn off all the participants' audio, um, so if you do ask a question uh, verbally, we're not going to be able to hear it, and we just did that to minimize a lot of the background noise that may occur. So once again, questions, feel free to write them in the chat box, um, or after the presentation, you can always call the office or email one of our, our consultants, and we'll get you an answer. All right, so the topics uh, that we're going to go over today um, is first, I want to provide an uh, an overview of OSHA's fourth annual fall protection stand down, uh, provide an, an overview of OSHA's Region 3 Focus 4 campaign, uh, provide an overview of the fall protection regulations and construction. Once again, it's not a very extensive thorough training, it's more of an overview um, of the regulations. And lastly, uh, go over some fall protection technology. Um, the folks in my world, uh, we see this stuff a lot going to different conferences. Um, receiving different emails, periodicals, and so forth. Uh, some folks that are actually out there executing this stuff, there's technology that's out there today um, that a lot of you may have never, never seen before and don't even know exists. So I just want to give an opportunity to uh, show what some of those technologies are, uh, which will help solve a lot of the fall protection issues uh, you may have on the job site. So first off, let's just fall protection stand down. Let's just fall protection stand down. It's a national um, event. Um, and it's simply asking employers um, to take, this, take a break, stop, and discuss fall protection with your employees. This national stand-down event is taking place this week, which is May 8th through the 12th. This webinar event is essentially a stand-down in, in and of itself. Uh, but once again, it's just a voluntary event for employers to participate, to stop, and discuss fall protection with their employees. Um, if you have a, a stand-down event for fall protection, it can be as minor as a five-minute toolbox talk. Some employers may take the whole day and do training, communicate with employees, inspect fall protection equipment. So almost anything goes. Um, it's just asking you to, to take a break during this week at some point in time and discuss fall protection with your employees. Um, you can use it as an opportunity once again to uh, express your expectations as the employer with those employees in regards to using fall protection. Uh, it's an opportunity for the employees to provide use the employer feedback on the types of equipment they use, maybe issues they run into, um, alternative protection measures. Um, so once again, anybody can participate. It's voluntary. Um, one key um, one key tool that's out there is if you go to the OSHA webpage and you just type in the search engine uh, fall protection stand down. Um, you'll see it, the screen will come up, much like the photo that I have on the, the slide there. Um, and there is a, a wealth of information on there. There's uh, pre-made toolbox talks relative to fall protection. Um, there's videos that are posted on there from prior um, stand downs that other employers have done. Uh, and then when you do that, you'll see a, um, a box in there that you can click where you can print a certificate for your employees uh, just to show their participation. And then if you'd like to, um, there's another uh, link there where you can share your story with OSHA if, if you'd like to communicate that. Um, so once again, that's going on this week. Um, it's May 8th through 12th. Um, 
and, and obviously we'd like to have everybody participate in um, that. And that goes, once again, that's across all industries. So that's um, general industry, construction, military, whatever it may be. Everybody's welcome to participate in that. Next thing I'd like to discuss brief, briefly is OSHA's Region 3 Focus 4 Hazards Campaign. Here in Pennsylvania, we're part of uh, Region 3. And this actually began out of the Philadelphia area office. And it was just an effort by that office to um, get the word out about the leading cause of construction fatalities historically um, across the country. And as you see there on the bottom of the screen, um, OSHA's Fable 4, 937 uh, construction workers died in 2015 based off of hazards and events that go back to these Fatal 4 hazards. Um, falls, electrocutions, struck by, and caught in between. So they began this program uh, back in February, and they were just covering a different topic each month. And we try to put out communications, toolbox talks, et cetera, related back to these four topics. Um, if you take a look at the uh, screen, the, the photo um, on the right hand upper portion of your screen there, there's actually a ton of outreach training on this website. If you just go to the website and you type in Fatal 4, um, there's a ton, ton of stuff on there relative to those four types of hazards. Um, probably the most alarming thing is and what we're going to talk about today is if you take a look at those 937, you see how it breaks down um, back in 2015. Nearly 40% of those fatalities uh, across the country in 2015 were based off of falls. So that's 364 people, so essentially one a day. Um, in the country, there will be a, a fall-related fatality in the construction industry. Um, the most, one of the most alarming things about that is every one of those 364 is preventable, every one of them. And if you take a look at those 364, that's 364 people who obviously directly had a fatality. But if you, if you consider the amount of people that those lives affected, every one of those 364 was a father, a mother, a brother, um, each one of them are, are affecting countless numbers of people. So 364, one a day on average, um, but you have thousands of people that are affected by fatalities which are completely preventable. Right, so with that Focus 4 Hazards campaign, once again, we said again in February, there's a different topic each month. So here we are now in May. It's wrapping up with fall protection. Um, if you'd like to participate, um, it's probably not too late to do that. If you would like information and maybe participate next year um, for the full four-month term, um, what you can do is contact your local area office. And what they'll do is they'll send you out uh, the weekly toolbox talks to give with your employees and then offer you the opportunity to, to share that with your colleagues, employees, trade groups, et cetera. Okay, so what I'm going to get into now is just going to be a basic overview of fall protection in, um, in the construction industry. So if we first start off and ask ourselves, you know, why, is it, why is it so important? Obviously, if we took a look at the numbers there, we had roughly one person a day across the country last year dying from a fatal fall. Historically, um, one third of all fatalities in the construction industry tie back to a fall, a fall causing the fatality. Once again, nearly 40% in 2015. If we just take a look at the, um, the biology and the physics of the fall, it takes almost a third of a second to recognize an employee's going to fall, uh, assuming, let's say, they're up on a, a upper level, um, they're elevated, they're doing work. So, and they begin to fall, it's going to take a third of a second to recognize the fall and another third of a second to attempt to react to the fall. If you take a look at the, the kind of the crude graph there on the right, if you take two-thirds of a second, they really can fall seven feet by that point. So by the time your body realizes you're falling and attempts to react, the human body has already fallen approximately seven feet. In two seconds, you can fall 64 feet. And if you kind of just, you can sit back and think about how quick it actually happens. The bottom line is, if you're working in an elevated position and you begin to fall, you will not be able to react quickly enough to stop yourself. Um, and once again, it's um, how a lot of these fatalities occur. All right, so it's just, um, they summarize their, their basic fall protection regulations in subpart M. And essentially within subpart M, what they say is an employee on a walking working service um, greater than six feet uh, needs to be protected from a fall. And this will apply to excavations, uh, like it says below there, and or dangerous equipment. You may have an employee working above dangerous equipment um, less than six feet. They would still need to be protected from that fall and contacting that equipment. Subpart M doesn't apply to workers inspecting, investigating, or assessing conditions prior to the start of work 
or after all construction activities have been completed. So what that doesn't say is that it doesn't say that you still wouldn't potentially have fall hazards and maybe fall hazards that you need to control. What it's saying is um, the subpart M wouldn't apply if, let's say, uh, you're a roofer and you need to access a roof to take a look at the roof prior to submitting a bid for roof work. Um, you technically, subpart M fall protection wouldn't apply then. Once again, it doesn't mean there isn't a hazard there. It doesn't mean that there's not a hazard that could be controlled. It just means the subpart M wouldn't apply. In addition, um, the Section 501, the duty to have fall protection with, within subpart M, doesn't apply to the following. Um, scaffolds, cranes, derricks, steel erection, certain tunneling operation, erection of tanks, construction of electrical transmission and distribution lines, and stairways and ladders. You can see there um, on the slide which of those subparts would apply to the duty to have fall protection in those specific applications. So keep in mind, um, once again, it doesn't say that fall hazards don't exist when you're doing those activities. What it's saying is there's a different standard which kicks in, which is going to discuss the requirements of when fall protection needs to be utilized. Um, keep in mind, the fall protection requirements um, and the utilization oftentimes they'll refer back to um, Section 502 in Subpart M, which discusses um, the actual fall protection equipment. So Subpart L and scaffolds may talk about um, fall protection not being required until you hit a level of 10 feet. But when, it, when fall protection is required, and let's say a, um, a body harness and lanyard is going to be the solution to that, oftentimes it will refer back to 502 in subpart M, which discusses the requirements for that fall protection system. So just keep that in mind. All right, so what are the employer's responsibilities in the construction industry relative to uh, preventing workers from falling? First thing you need to do is assess the workplace for fall hazards. Um, and one good place to start is um, it's actually consider the strength of the walking working surfaces the employees are going to be on. Um, this oftentimes becomes either most critical in new construction um, or it may be demolition to where uh, the walking working surface may be compromised. So before we even begin to consider um, protecting the employees from falling off the leading edge, off an I-beam, off a truss, we have to take into consideration the surface we're going to have them standing on a working board support their weight to begin with. Um, and what you want to do is consider, consider all phases of work. So everything from the time the materials are delivered um, until the final construction is complete. You want to ask yourself, where do we have fall hazards and what are we going to do to, to mitigate or minimize those hazards? So if we just kind of take a look at the basic uh, hierarchy of controls you have in um, any, type of, any type of safety or, or health realm, um, you have uh, engineering controls, administrative controls, and then lastly PPE. So the same thing applies to fall protection um, and preventing falls. The first thing you want to ask is, can we eliminate the fall hazard? It is, is it absolutely necessary that we expose employees to the fall hazard? Depending on the situation, you may be able to eliminate it completely. If you can't eliminate it completely, you may be able to minimize it. If you take a look at the photo there uh, on the right-hand slide, you can see where they've actually um, pre-installed some of the trusses um, so they can lift multiple truss units in one section. It doesn't mean the em an employee is not going to have to go up and make that connection, but what it's going to drastically do is minimize the amount of time they're actually exposed to the fall hazard. Um, the second thing you can kind of see they did there on that photo was they pre-attached some of the guardrail systems they're going to be using, uh, which once again, it minimizes the fall hazard and it minimizes the time that the employees are going to be exposed to that fall hazard. Um, depending on the level that you can eliminate or minimize the hazard, uh, the next thing you may want to consider is fall prevention. Um, and the fall prevention in that photo there is going to be the actual guardrail system. And then you consider um, you may have opportunities where you can't install the fall prevention. We still need to protect the employee, and that's where we're going to take a look at the fall protection and fall arrest system, which gets into the harness, the lanes, the retractables, all that stuff. So if we can't prevent the fall by using fall prevention, um, what are we going to do to prevent the injury or the fatality if the employee does fall? So just to point that once again to, uh, to discuss that, fall, pretension, fall, fall prevention is going to be what's the system that's going to prevent the employee from falling, which is always going to, um, if you do have to work at elevation, that's going to be the first option we're always going to choose when possible. Let's try to prevent the fall. Um, so just an example there would be a guard rail system. If that's not feasible um, or that can't be done for some reason, we still need to protect the employee from the fall, the next option is we're going to utilize fall protection, which gets in the anchorage, the harness, the lanyards, et cetera. 
So with the fall protection, we're not going to prevent the fall, but what we're going to attempt to do is prevent the employee from hitting a lower level if they do fall. Um, one thing to keep in mind with fall protection and why you generally want PPE to be a last resort is um, there's a lot more that has to go right with the fall protection system. So um, if we're going to choose that uh, as our option to prevent the employee from contacting a lower surface if they do fall, we have to keep in mind um, the anchorage um, has to be able to support the capacity uh, required for the fall. The equipment has to be used properly, inspected. Um, there's a lot more that has to go away if we're going to kind of default to the fall protection, but it's a you know it's a valid option. All right, so uh, within uh, 1926-502, they're going to discuss guardrail systems. So within general, um, you can kind of see a typical guardrail there on the right. Um, the top rail of a, of a typical guardrail system is going to be 42 inches, and within the standard, um, that's a give or take three inches. So you got a plus or minus there. Um, the next options and next things you want to add um, to your guardrail system after the top rail, which is always going to be there, you have some options. You can uh, install a mid rail, screens or mesh, intermediate members or other structural members. So when you see on the slide there it says if used, it doesn't mean that you have the option to not use any of them. It means you have to basically pick one of the four. If you choose a mid rail, and assuming your top rail is 42 inches, your mid rail is going to be 21 inches. If you um, have a, a top rail that's you know plus or minus within that three, you're just going to split the difference with your mid rail. So it's going to be halfway between the top rail and the working surface. Um, the top rail needs to be able to support 200 pounds. The mid rail needs to be able to support 150. If you, uh, in lieu of using a mid rail, you decide to use screeners or mesh, uh, the, the screener mesh has to, has to extend from the top rail down to the working surface and, and along the entire opening and to be able to support 150 pounds. Um, an intermediate member, sometimes um, you may, instead of a mid rail, decide to use a baluster. Uh, they have to be 19 inches or less apart to be able to support 150 pounds. Or if you install other structural members, and maybe uh, maybe some type of architectural panel, um, maybe additional mid rails uh, for aesthetic aesthetic, aesthetic purposes, um, you can have no opening greater than 19 inches wide and has to be able to support 150 pounds. So pretty typical guard rail that are shown um, on the right hand slide. Now, when designing the guardrail system, um, OSHA does provide uh, an Appendix B in Subpart M. Well, once again, it's a, a non-mandatory guideline, so they're not saying you have to use Subpart M, or pardon me, Appendix B of the Subpart M. All they're doing is giving you some recommendations to get started with your guardrail system. And they're essentially not saying that if you use these components for your guardrail, it's going to be adequate or able to support the capacity. Um, they're just providing you with some recommendations on to begin designing your guardrail system um, which you could use. So they're giving you some, um, some some points to start with with the wood railings. It gives you some uh, requirements there, a place to start, uh, wood railings, pipe railings, and structural steel railings. So once again, just kind of a, a starting point for it. All right, with the guardrail system, um, any system you use with the guardrail system has to be free of puncture or laceration or not have any other hazards which may snag the clothes. Um, sometimes you'll run into situations where employees are trying to use steel or plastic banding for guardrails. That's prohibited. You can't do that. However, you can use wire rope. Um, if, you, or if you do use wire rope, it has to be a minimum of a quarter inch wire rope, and it has to be flagged every six feet at a minimum um, with some type of high-vis material um, just so you know, employees on the work site can see and recognize there's actually um, a system erected there. All right, the next thing to uh, keep in mind is falling object protection. Falling object protection um, is discussed in 502 Part J, and essentially that's what most people are going to talk about with the tow board. Um, the tow board needs to be able to withstand 50 pounds of force, be a minimum of three and a half inch height, which is going to be your standard two by four. You can have a max quarter inch clearance from the working surface um, in the bottom of the tow board, and no opening along that tow board can be more than a quarter inch. Um, when you're working on, if you're working on steep slope, slope roofs, uh, it's going to require a tow board um, always. Um, so it's give you a pretty good uh, pictogram there on the right side to show a typical um, guardrail system there, the spacing for the posts. Um, one other thing to keep in mind about the falling object protection is what the tow board is designed to do. It's designed to stop uh, materials, uh, tools, etc., from sliding off the working surface to the working level below. Uh, one thing to keep in mind, probably even more often than that, um, the hazard with falling objects 
um, comes from the actually the employees working in an elevated position, dropping things. Um, it can be tool, uh, tools, hammers, uh, wrenches, screwdrivers, spud bars. Um, one of the things that you could, uh, you may want to research a little bit is um, if that's obviously a concern that you would have, it's, it's employees working in elevated positions with hand tools. Um, if you just do a general web search for um, tooling lanyards, um, fall protection for tools, um, there's a huge industry focused around that now where a lot of uh, falling uh, protection equipment manufacturers are actually designing tethers um, in a lot of pretty neat, uh, useful tools where the workers in the elevated position can actually um, attach their tools to their self, to their wrist, um, which would prevent the tools uh, from falling from a higher level on the potentially employees working below. Um, just discussing here with holes, I'm showing you a typical hole on the, on the right-hand photo there with a pretty standard guardrail system. Uh, and then there's another section within the standard 502i which discusses hole covers. Uh, so a hole cover has to be able to support two times the max load, be secured from displacement, and marked or color-coded. It's pretty typical um, on a construction job site there where it has, um, it has your, four, your hole cover and then just says hole on it. So that's pretty standard. However, within the regulations, they do permit you to color code those as long as the employees are trained to understand what the color codes mean. All right, so um, if we're starting to work beyond fall prevention now, so we said our first option is we want to prevent the employer from falling, which is going to be uh, the guardrail system. If that's not feasible um, for the nature of work we're doing, um, another option is we're going to protect the employee from a fall. So we're going to say, okay, the fall may occur, but what are we going to do to prevent the employee from contacting a surface blow? One option um, that Subpart M will permit um, in 502C is to use uh, the safety net system. If the safety net system is utilized, uh, it can never be more than 30 feet below the working level. Um, and then sufficient clearance has to be provided underneath. So if we do have an employee fall into the net, um, obviously that net is going to um, have some give to it. So the employee is going to fall lower than the net. We need to, be make, we need to make sure that the net is going to be of an adequate height above anything below um, that's going to prevent that employee from contacting a lower surface. If you take a look at the chart below there, um, it talks about the vertical distance from the uh, working level to the horizontal plane of the net. So we said you can never go beyond 30 feet below. Uh, but depending um, on what distance you're going below, you may actually need to extend that net out further, um, just understanding the fact the employee isn't necessarily going to fall straight down. So they're going to fall down, but potentially out from the working surface um, up to some distance. So you can kind of see there based off how low you put the net below the working surface, how far out horizontally that net needs to extend. Um, with the safety net system, if, if you do uh, utilize a safety net system, it has regulations relative to drop testing um, and the requirements of drop testing. So rather than going over all those requirements, uh, I just noted it there. It's in uh, 502C4I, which will talk, talk about the drop test requirements for the safety netting. Um, and there are exceptions to the drop test. Um, within 1926, 502C4II, where if you can't do the drop test um, for some reason, um, the employee or the designated competent person must certify that the net is installed and in compliance with the standard in, for, in per the manufacturer recommendations. So one thing I did underline there was competent person, and I just want to take a moment there to discuss what that actually is. Um, OSHA defines what a competent person is and a qualified person in 1926.32. Um, competent person and qualified person are terms that you'll see come up throughout the OSHA construction regulations. However, in fall protection standards, these, are, uh, these terms are caught out um, even more so than just in the, the other standards that you'll see. So essentially what a competent person is, a competent person is one who is capable, capable of identifying the hazards um, relative to the work taking place and has the authority to correct those hazards. So that's a competent person. What a qualified person is, um, one who by possession of a recognized degree, certificate, professional standing, or has demonstrated the knowledge, training, and experience to successfully resolve problems. So a competent person is, um, you have the ability to recognize the hazard and the authority to correct it. A qualified person is um, essentially showing a higher level there of understanding um, what the hazards are and how to correct the hazards. So throughout the standard, um, and as I'm kind of providing the overview here, um, when these different terms come up, I, I did underline them and, and highlight them just to kind of um, give you the understanding as what level of employee would need to uh, resolve the particular issue. All right, so um, 
if we're not going to install the safety net, so we've already determined that uh, the guardrail system um, isn't going to maybe work for every application, uh, we're not going to use a safety net, the next option there is we're going to actually go to a fall arrest system. Um, the fall arrest systems are discussed in 502 Part D, um, and typical fall arrest system is going to consist of an anchorage, um, your body wear, which is essentially going to be your harness, and then con the connecting device, which may be a lanyard, a retractable, um, whatever you're going to use to connect to um, the anchorage system. All right, so the, the anchorage for the fall arrest system. Anchorages have to be capable of supporting 5,000 pounds per, per employee attached. So essentially, you need to be attached to something structural. Um, let's say um, the anchorage points that would be available for the task um, aren't going to be able to support 5,000 pounds, or you're not sure if they would. What I should permit you to do is um, you could um, design that anchorage as part of a complete system as long as you can ensure you're maintaining a safety factor of two. So somebody going to need to determine based off of what the anchorage system and the connecting means you're using, how much force you can potentially generate on that anchorage. And if you can ensure the amount of force, uh, the max generated, um, is whatever number it is, and you multiply that times two, um, you could use that as an anchorage um, as long as that's under the supervision of a qualified person. So oftentimes you may see um, an anchorage where you're, we're not sure if it's going to be able to support the 5,000 pounds, so an option may be for the anchorage, we're going to use a self-retracting lanyard, which is going to minimize the fall distance, minimize the force generated to maybe 400 pounds, um, so we'll take that, multiply it times two, so we get 800, 900 pounds, um, and then as long as the manufacturer of that equipment and a qualified person uh, determines that that's going to be an adequate anchorage, you could use that. So on a typical body harness here, um, just showing the importance of the chest strap being tightened. Um, you want it snug in the shoulders. The typical thing you want to keep in mind when you're in putting on your body harness is you want to use it um, for the fall, not for comfort. So we're going to put the harness on, not to the point we can't move, we can't walk around, we can't work, but we don't want to leave the components so loose that if we did fall, it's not going to work properly. Um, so it's showing that the lace uh, straps should be snug but not binding. Um, a pretty good rule of thumb there for most manufacturers is if you can slide your hand or three or four fingers um, between your leg and the strap, it's probably snug enough. Um, the D-ring should always be between the shoulder blades and the butt strap uh, intended to support the weight of the load. So keep in mind, if you do fall, um, that butt strap is where we want the load to be exerted, not necessarily on your shoulders, on the hips, or anywhere else. So um, we're going to use it per the manufacturer guidelines, um, and then use it um, and, it's, and put it on in a fashion that if we would happen to fall, it's going to be able to do its job. All right, so just taking a look at a typical uh, personal fall arrest system here. Uh, we have an employee on a working surface. I'm using a six-foot length of lanyard. So what the standard says is whatever uh, fall protection um, system we're using, the max arresting force on the body can be 1,800 pounds. And if you take a look at the fall protection equipment you're using, I mean, and look at what the manufacturer specifications are for that equipment, they'll, they'll provide you with that information relative to the amount of force and the amount of poundage that will be generated if you use the system properly. The standard says we can free fall no more than six feet um, or contact any lower level. Um, and the distance from decelerization um, has to be has to stop our movement within three feet of that being enacted. So what you're going to see there on the third of the right, we have the employee. Um, they have a standard six foot length of lanyard. They have a three and a half foot decelerization device. And what that is is if you take a look at your standard lanyard, um, you're going to have that little section of webbing that's sewed into a pack. Um, generally, that's going to be the section that's uh, directly connects to your D-ring. And what that is is a decelerization device. So um, when you do fall. We're going to extend that six-foot lanyard to its full length. And what's actually kind of slowing you down to minimize the amount of force generated on your body um, is going to be the webbing tearing out of that decelerization device. So generally, they're going to be three to three and a half feet. Um, if you take a look at the photo, there you see that three and a half feet. We see the six-foot height of the worker and then a three-foot safety factor. So the one thing you really want to keep in mind there is um, if you're going to use a standard lanyard for fall protection, um, and let's say we're going to use that at, you know, above six feet, you can see from the 18 and a half feet um, total distance from the anchorage, you need to understand that if you are tied off, by the time you fall, um, you consider the height of the worker, the shock absorber portion of the lanyard, and any stretch that may be in the harness, you need to have clearance from the work level below. So oftentimes on a job site, we may see um, an employee that's utilizing a body harness, utilizing a standard lanyard, they're tied off over six feet, but they're working if you off the ground. So the 
the intent is there. They're, you know, they're using their equipment. They're tied off. The problem is the execution. If they would fall, they're going to contact the ground regardless. Um, so that's just something you want to consider. When the situations present themselves, another alternative uh, to using that uh, standard shock absorbing lanyard uh, is going to be, uh, or pardon me, the standard lanyard is going to be a uh, uh, retractable lanyard, which you can see there the photo on the right. It's showing where you have a standard shock absorbing lanyard. You need essentially 18 feet from the height of the anchorage um, to the work surface below where that employee could land. The shock absorbing lanyard, uh, there are part of the retractable lanyard on the right, is going to stop the employee a lot quicker. Generally, they're, uh, they're going to walk up within two to two and a half feet. And they're stopping the worker so quickly after the fall, um, there's really no need for a shock absorber or anything like that. The other benefit to it is if you take a look at the photo on the right, if an employee does fall, um, that worker can essentially reach the working level, um, which makes uh, the res a rescue a lot easier, where essentially a lot of times if they're using a uh, retractable lanyard, they're tied off overhead, and they would happen to fall, they can essentially perform a self-rescue uh, by simply um, using their arms or legs and just climbing back onto the work surface. All right, so um, let's say we're using standard uh, fall protection equipment. Uh, now we do fall, so the, the anchorage is proper, the equipment we utilize proper, it stopped the employee from the fall, everything's good up to that point. Um, now the problem we're presented with is what do we do? Uh, we have an employee that's suspended from uh, some type of fall protection system, um, and now we have to get them, which once again, um, the photo there that you see, assuming that gentleman's probably using a standard lanyard, um, he's wherever he's anchored to, plus his six foot of his body, he's some level below, um, and now we're going to have to have some plan in place um, to get that guy, um, which is something you always want to consider on your job sites, if, uh, depending on what system you're using for fall protection, where could he potentially fall from, where would the guy be positioned, and then how are we going to get that person um, within a reasonable time frame. So you always want to consider the rescue. Um, and the photos here are just showing some examples of uh, why we want the weight um, exerted on that butt strap of the harness. If we have the harness uh, in, uh, installed or, or put on improperly and we have it maybe too tight in the legs, um, too tight in the arms, this chest strap too tight, we're going to start to exert some pressure in other parts of the body where the essentially your body, um, it could cause other, other issues if we leave the person um, hanging in a harness too long, um, especially if the harness isn't, um, isn't worn entirely correct. So this is something else you want to consider. In 1926, uh, 502, um, OSHA will discuss uh, positioning device systems. So in some situations, uh, positioning device may be utilized to prevent a fall. Um, the benefit to it is it allows the worker to work with both hands free. Um, however, you have, the system is going to be utilized where it will uh, prevent any fall greater than distance from two feet. So if you take a look at the photo on the right, the guy's using a, a positioning system, um, and they're essentially very short lanyards, and it's going to drastically minimize his fall if he would happen to slip there. Um, the anchorage for positioning systems has to be designed to hold uh, two pounds of potential impact of load, or 3,000 pounds, whichever is greater. Body belts are permitted for anchorage, so in general fall protection, um, you're never going to use, um, or you're not going to be permitted to use a body belt uh, for an employee that's going to be exposed to a potentially six foot fall. Body belts are permitted for work positioning systems. However, what you're going to see uh, more often or not now is um, very few body belts out in the industry. Um, mostly you're going to see full body harnesses that have actually the V rings also built into the, the sides um, under the waist strap. Um, which can be utilized for uh, positioning the system, like you see there on the photo to the right. Another option for uh, fall prevention is uh, it's a fall restraint system. Subpart M in OSHA doesn't discuss fall restraints, but they do recognize it as a viable option to prevent a fall. Um, there's actually letters of interpretation that will discuss fall present prevention systems. The key to the fall prevention system, um, if you're utilizing it, it needs to prevent a fall from any distance. So you can see the system there on the right is designed um, where the worker essentially can get up to the edge, but they can't go beyond it. So we're preventing the fall um, altogether. Um, the photo there on the right uh, looks like that guy's probably using a standard six-foot lanyard, um, and he can't go any further than that leading edge. So he can't get up to the point he falls. Um, theoretically, you could use a retractable lanyard there. You just need to make sure that the retractable lanyard total length um, isn't going to be beyond the length from that anchorage to the edge. Um, so that's just something you want to keep in mind. Um, 
the uh, for a fall uh, arrest system or fall restraint system, um, you are once again permitted to use a body belt because you're not actually uh, permitting the employee to fall any distance. However, more often than not, you're probably going to use a standard body harness there and just tie off to the D-ring. And um, within the letters of interpretation, they discuss the anchorages um, that would be required for that. And with that, actually, that restraint device, the capacity would have to be able to hold. All right, another option for uh, for falls um, is OSHA that we'll discuss in 502F, warning line systems. The thing to keep in mind, um, these systems are uh, very specific to the type of work you're doing. Um, so it's for, they're designed for roofing work um, on low slope roofs. So uh, it's essentially a, a barrier erected between the edge um, and the workers, um, which is going to warn them that they're approaching the edge um, on a slope roof system. Um, so if you take a look at them, or pardon me, on the, um, a low slope roof. So if you take a look at the system there, um, it's a warning line, consists of, of ropes, wires, chains, etc. Very specific to the type of work you're doing, um, if it's permitted or not permitted. And then with that warning line system, um, there's some guidelines that talk about how it needs to be erected. So essentially, um, it's erected around all exposed edges. Um, if you're using mechanical equipment on roofs, um, where you're using a warning line system, uh, maybe in addition to or in lieu of other conventional means of fall uh, protection, fall prevention, such as guardrails, um, it being tied off, et cetera. Um, they provide some further guidelines. Um, if you're using mechanical equipment, um, there's some guidelines there depending on what direction the mechanical equipment's moving, how far from the edge that the warning line uh, be installed. It needs to be flagged every six feet. Um, the low point of the warning line can't be less than 34 inches, higher than 39. The stances of the uh, warning line system have to be able to support 16 pounds of force when directed 30 inches above the work surface. There's a minimum tensile strength. And then if you pull on one section of a warning line, it can't be designed where it takes up slack in another section before the stanchion ultimately falls. Just keep in mind, the warning lines, um, obviously, they're not going to prevent the fall um, as directly as a guardrail system or an actual fall uh, protection system would. Um, it's just another option, depending on the scope of the work, which may be um, permissible within the regulations. Secondary option is a controlled access zone. Um, the one thing you want to keep in mind here, with the controlled access zone, you're essentially not directly preventing the worker from falling off the leading edge. What the controlled access zone is, it's preventing other people from getting into the area um, where that leading edge or that potential fall hazard exists. Um, and there are very specific uh, types of work where controlled access zones are actually permitted. Um, you have to be doing leading edge work or overhead brick laying or, or related work um, before this is even an option. Um, but essentially with the controlled access zone, you're defining to other employees on that work surface where that fall hazard exists, um, where they need to be concerned with um, encountering that fall hazard. So there are some guidelines there that uh, will go along with how far away from that fall hazard the controlled access and set up, uh, how the controlled access line um, is, uh, is installed, how it's flagged, what the high point, the low point, the breaking strength, et cetera. So once again, keep in mind, in a typical fall hazard type situation, you can't automatically just go, to, we're going to install a warning line, we're just going to use the control access zone. Um, it's very specific to the type of work you're doing. Um, and then with that, with the, with the controlled access system, um, or a controlled access zone, you're actually required to use a safety monitor um, for those types of operations. So that safety monitor, um, it's basically a designated competent person who essentially their main task is going to be warn other people from entering that controlled access zone and then warn employees when they're encountering where that fall hazard is within that controlled access zone. Um, so the safety monitor must be competent um, to recognize those hazards, be able to warn other employees when they're approaching those fall hazards, be on the same working level, close enough to communicate, and have no other duties on a working level um, instead other than you know, notifying employees of those hazards. Uh, the other thing you want to keep in mind, once you get into situations, if you're permitted to use um, a controlled access and a safety monitor based off the scope of the work, um, that you have to, uh, in turn, have a fall protection plan um, per 1926-502K, which discusses specifically what that process is going to be to use that control access zone um, and that safety monitor. So with that fall protection plan, um, that's discussed um, in, on 502K of the standard. The thing you want to keep in mind about a fall protection plan, um, it's was limited to residential construction work, precast concrete work, and, re and leading edge work. So just because you're doing construction, construction work doesn't mean that you can automatically default to 
um, hey, we can't use conventional fall protection for this job. Um, we're just going to develop a fall protection plan and train employees on it and go from there. It may not apply to the type of work you're doing, um, number one. Um, and then secondly, that, that fall protection plan has to discuss why you can't use conventional means of fall protection um, during that project. So those um, infeasible means of using the, the standard fall protection types of equipment, um, you have to be able to prove that from a compliance standpoint of why you're going to default to a fall protection plan in lieu of using standard fall protection equipment. The fall protection plan needs to be written. It needs to be prepared by a qualified person. We discussed earlier what that was. Developed specifically for the site where the work is taking place. So if you're within the scope of the work where you could use a fall protection plan and you're able to demonstrate why you can't use conventional means of fall protection equipment to do that work, you could have a qualified person develop that plan. And the plan can be kind of a standard plan based off the scope of your work, of work you do, but it has to be specific for that job site you're working on. Um, the plan can be implemented on the site by a competent person, but it needs to be designed by a qualified person for that specific work site. All right, going uh, into 1926503, it discusses the training a little bit. Um, all workers who might be exposed to fall hazards um, on that job site should be trained in fall protection. Um, they need to be trained to recognize the fall hazards and how to minimize them. Um, in addition, um, you see the list there of the other items that the person needs to be trained for um, relative to fall protection, and they must be trained by a competent person who's qualified in the following areas. So once again, it's not saying a qualified person, it's saying a competent person um, who has an understanding of these following items relative to the fall protection equipment that's being used, the anchor system that's being used, how you're going to utilize it on your job sites, um, what role the employees are going to play with that fall protection equipment, how to properly use it, install it, inspect it, um, don and doff it, and then the subpar name and the fall protection standard um, in and of itself. The training needs to be documented, the names of the employees that are trained, the dates, signature of the employer or the person who conducted the training, and then obviously uh, retraining will be uh, conducted if there are changes that are entered previous training obsolete. Uh, fall protection equipment is changed, the fall protection system we use is going to change, or um, some type of uh, inadequacy was uh, revealed from the worker using the system, maybe a walkthrough, we've recognized an issue with the way the system was set up and utilized, um, whatever it may be. If we have a reason to believe the workers aren't utilizing the equipment properly, uh, we need to conduct retraining training from that, uh, in those um, opportunities. So the last thing that I wanted to go over here um, was new fall protection solutions. Now some of these solutions are newer than others, but I just wanted to kind of show you some things that are out there now that, once again, folks in, in my world see quite a bit when we go to conferences. Uh, we get safety magazines. Um, we have access to Internet sites and so forth. But we're seeing this stuff all the time. Some of you folks out there in the real world who actually have to execute this stuff may not know some of these solutions exist. So I just wanted to you know, point out a few of these things that are out there now. There are many manufacturers uh, making this stuff. Oftentimes, once you'll see, what you'll see from a fall protection equipment solution standpoint, um, once one of these manufacturers kind of come up with a new ID and start designing something, the rest of them kind of jump on board and start designing very similar things. So there's a lot of manufacturers that sell these components out here. Um, the biggest thing I can emphasize as you take a look at some of these photos that I'm going to show you is um, almost any fall hazard that you have out there, there's going to be a solution for it. Um, whether it's some type of guardrail system that's temporary, some type of fall protection system, um, the biggest thing I can emphasize is if you have a fall hazard and you don't know what the resolution is, your employees don't know how to resolve it, the best thing you can do is get on the phone, get on a website, contact some of these fall protection equipment suppliers. Um, they have the answers to this stuff. Um, just talk with them, maybe have them contact your job site, discuss your particular application that you can't find a solution to. Um, and these guys will help you find the answers. I mean, this, this stuff's out there. Uh, you just have to kind of know it exists and where to get started. This photo here is just showing a typical um, guardrail system, um, a temporary guardrail system, where it's uh, designed with the counterweight, it's non-penetrating, um, and essentially it can be moved from job site to job site. Here's some typical um, skylight, um, which, once again, if you're on a roof um, that has skylights, that's a fall hazard that needs to be controlled. Um, so here's some typical um, guardrail, or pardon me, guard systems for fall, uh, skylights, which can easily be installed. Some of them are penetrating where they're attached. Some of them aren't penetrating. Um, so there's a lot of variations out there. Here's a guardrail uh, skylight system, uh, pardon me, or, a, or a roof hatch system, which has a, a swing gate guardrail. So um, an employee could access the hatch. 
Um, get onto the roof, the guardrail, you push the guardrail open, it swings open, and they need to get back through the hatch, um, they just open the guardrail. Here's some non penetrating perimeter clamps for flat edge roof and parapet walls. Um, this stuff's out there. Pretty easy to set up if you have the equipment and, and you know how to utilize it. Um, here's some side deck mounting guardrail brackets for uh, which have a pretty uh, good application of residential construction where you could um, attach the, the bracket system to your job site, install the guardrail when you're done with the work, um, take the guardrail down, take the brackets down, and take them to the next job site. Here's a clamping system for flat light trailers. Um, here's a fall hazard a lot of employees don't think about, but uh, you obviously do have a hazard of falls. Um, you know, on flatbed trailers and such, and it's just a, a removable clamping system um, where you could install guardrails, uh, non permanently attach them to the, uh, the trailer. When you're done, take the guardrail down, take the clamps off, and move on to the next task. This device here is pretty neat. Um, I actually just ran across this at a safety conference I recently attended. There's manufacturers out there now that are making um, devices which attach to the harness and attach to your fall arrest system which will permit an employee to, once if they happen to fall, the fall arrest system they use, be it the lanyard or the retractable, is going to stop the fall. But what they actually do is um, they can enact, uh, it's kind of like a rip cord like you'd have on a parachute, which is going to descend them in a controlled speed to a lower level, which it's a pretty cool device. Um, once this manufacturer here saw it, they're making it now, and, and there's probably other manufacturers that if they don't have them all now, they're, they're going to start designing them. Um, this one you can kind of see there, uh, it's kind of tough to see, but it's a 50 foot. So essentially what happened is employee falls, they have this device attached to their harness, attached to, the, to their, um, their shock absorbing lanyard, whatever they're using. The lanyard stops the fall, they pull a cord on this device, which is after the fall stop, it's going to descend them to the lower level, and this one will actually go up to 50 feet, um, which then maybe solves a lot of your, your rescue issues you may have on a job site. Um, some talking about some personal fall rest system. Here's concrete anchors, um, anchors for standing seam roofs. Um, some of these are, can be designed to be permanent. The standing seam roof, roof anchors, yeah, you can install them for the work. When the work's done, you just um, disconnect it and take it with you to the next job site. There's a lot of stuff out there in uh, the residential construction world for roofers, for guys doing uh, truss work, re-roofing. Um, where they, you can actually install uh, anchor shoes where you may just leave them there after the job's complete. Um, or different items that are uh, removable that you install for the, your scope of work and then just take with you. Um, there's a lot of different tools out there and, and ways to do this, this type of work. Um, here's uh, different roof anchors and some other photos there um, for roofing and re-roofing activities. Once again, the best thing you could do is um, just get online, find some local fall protection equipment suppliers, and uh, have these guys come out, just, uh, talk about some various options with you, tell you, tell, have you tell them when you're struggling, when you're having trouble coming up with solutions, and these guys will, will find the interest for you. Um, there's a non-penetrating rooftop anchor for a fall restraint system there. Um, this device here is pretty cool. I just ran across this at a, at a recent safety conference as well. It's a mobile anchor system for fall protection, and you can see there that's just a device where uh, um, it's just kind of, it's a, a mobile device, you attach it to the hitch of your truck, drive it to the job site, um, and they go, depending on what height you get, I think they, this is probably a 30 foot, they go up to 50 foot. Um, here are guys utilizing the system, doing it looks like some scaffold, uh, scaffold erection or dismantling. Um, once again, that very, very cool solution, which is uh, feasible. Uh, it can be transported um, from site to site and be utilized pretty efficiently. Uh, um, it looks pretty effective. Um, here's just another mobile system which uh, attaches to the hitch of a, a truck. There's some other counterweight systems um, for, with just have a jib to them. Um, once again, these are designed, some of them are anchored permanently. A lot of them are designed where they could just be moved by a, uh, potentially a fork truck, move it to, from, uh, with the, on the job site, uh, or move it from facility to facility. Here's a portable anchor system, looks like for some uh, vehicle equipment maintenance these guys are performing, um, which is, once again, it's a mobile system. Lastly, I'd just like to uh, discuss briefly our OSHA consultation program, which most of you um, on this webinar today have probably taken advantage of before. Um, the consultation program is specifically designed for small and medium-sized businesses, um, which is 250 employees at a single site or 500 corporate-wide. Um, that's what OSHA considers a small business. Probably most businesses that, that we um, service on a day-to-day -day basis are, are more into the 10, 20, 30 employee range of the site. Um, would anything 250 um, at a single site or 500 corporate line um, 
less would apply. Um, we give priority to employers in high hazard industries. Once again, if you're if you're in the scope of your work involves fall hazards, those are high hazards um, involved in hazardous operations. And then we do honor requests um, from uh, employers with more employees. It's just that uh, we oftentimes have to do that in a limited scope, um, and we give priority to the, the smaller employers with uh, the higher hazard industries. Um, what we're different from enforcement is um, we don't issue citations, fines, penalties, anything like that. However, you have to request our service. Um, so you have to, uh, you know, give us a call, get online, and put a request in for a visit. Um, from an employer obligation standpoint, um, you need to agree to correct any serious or imminent danger hazards. Um, now, the benefit to it is if you do request our service and we identify a serious hazard, the duration of time from we recognize the hazard um, and you're working on correcting the hazard, you can't receive the program notion inspection uh, and be cited for that hazard, assuming that you have inner protections in place during that time. So once again, you ask for our service, we come out, do a walkthrough, we potentially identify some hazards. While you're working on ultimately correcting those hazards, um, you can't get cited um, for those hazards for a program inspection. And then lastly, if you do, um, if you don't comply, you know, with the with correcting the hazard within the time frame, we must uh, refer to OSHA. But I can tell you, I've been with the program about five years now, and I don't think that's happened yet since I've been here. Um, usually, once again, most of the employers that do request our service, um, they want to do the right thing. They just need some assistance and some guidance on how to do uh, what they need to do and solve the problem. So usually, that's not an issue um, getting the items corrected within a reasonable time frame. So lastly, um, you know, it's a free service. Um, uh, ultimately, we want to help employers correct hazards, avoid OSHA penalties, litigation costs, reduce, uh, reduce the cost of um, the workers' comp costs, or sort of reduce the cost of your facility, not only from potential citations, but the cost of, in, of having injuries in and of itself, um, minimize equipment damage and, and product loss. Uh, and just on an average, a consultant will identify seven serious or other serious hazards, which potentially could be a huge savings uh, monetarily, uh, to the employer, especially being that the, um, the cost of the citations has recently gone up. Um, not only that, you know, if we can prevent um, or help you prevent one significant injury, um, you know, it could be an immeasurable cost. So uh, once again, you know, feel free to take advantage of the service. This webinar, um, we'll have this posted on the website um, within two weeks uh, of today. Any questions you do ask during the chat, um, or if you happen to call in or email in with some questions uh, regarding this webinar, um, in a follow-up. Within the next week or so, we'll go ahead and answer those questions and pull, put all that stuff online as well along with the webinar. There's a phone number there below. Um, probably the easiest way to put a request in if, if you'd like to do that would be to go to our website, which is listed there. Um, and then you'll see a tab on that website that just says submit a request. Go ahead and click that tab, um, fill out the pertinent information, um, hit submit, and then um, one of our office staff will send you an email back just essentially saying you're uh, Request has been assigned, give you the contact name and, and information for the consultants that have been assigned, uh, and then we'll go ahead and contact you and go from there. So I'd just like to uh, thank everybody for participating today. Once again, if you have any questions or follow-up questions, um, feel free to give us a call. Feel, feel free to put a request in for service. Um, we'll have the, this presentation posted along with the other um, applicable questions, um, and uh, go forth. You have a safe day. Thanks, everybody.